grace and mercy. The microphone is not cooperating today. Grace and mercy and peace. Those are yours. Those are your gifts from God. And they come through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our focus is the gospel. We, we just heard that. We'll be uh, reading those verses as we go through our sermon this morning. I'm curious if there are any pictures of Jesus that really stick out to you. Do you have some favorite pictures of Jesus? Maybe if you grew up in the church and you went to Sunday school, you, you remember one of those pictures that your teacher showed you and it just kind of stuck with you your whole life. Maybe you received a, a gift from somebody, a, a wall hanging, and you have that in your house and you just see that every day and that, that really sticks out to you. Do you have a favorite picture of Jesus? I definitely have my favorite pictures of Jesus, but does this sound weird? Is this a weird admission from your pastor that I don't have a lot of favorite pictures of Jesus? <laughs> I just don't. I never have. I'm pretty picky about the pictures of Jesus that I like. And, and I wonder, I don't know, it's different for everybody, but I wonder if this is why, okay? I, I, if you Google pictures of Jesus, these are some of the top ones that you see, and these are familiar ones. I'm not saying these are bad. Uh, we're going to look for a theme in these pictures that I see. Maybe some of you have these pictures at home. Or if you look at the most famous of pictures of Jesus ever painted throughout history, you get a lot of Renaissance artists. You get uh, Leonardo da Vinci with the, the Last Supper. Um, I think he's attributed to the, with this picture too. And then this one was interesting to me, uh, the Madonna and child. And Jesus looks like a man-child there, doesn't he? <laughs> but did you notice that all these pictures, you notice a theme with all these pictures? He's not smiling. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's good. We didn't set this up either. Yeah, he's not smiling. He's never smiling in these pictures. It seems like Jesus always has this serious face, this intense face, or maybe he's forlorn or sad. And I get it. I, I really do. Jesus had a very serious job to do, didn't he? He, he came to save people from eternal separation from God. And that job was serious, and that job involved a lot of suffering and sadness. So I get why that face is always on Jesus. But as you look at picture after picture of Jesus, you start to get this impression that maybe he only had one emotion. He was only ever serious. He was only ever sad. That's all you ever see, right? And so I wonder if that's why these words from John 15 really catch us off guard. Did you catch what Jesus said about himself? And if he did, did you really think about the words that he used about himself? Let me refresh your memory a little bit. He says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. Wait a minute. What word did Jesus use? Joy? And, and he even used a word in front of it. My joy. Hold on to your seats. Jesus was actually joyful. <laughs> you never know it from the pictures, but from the scriptures, we see that Jesus was joyful. And that's an amazing thing. And not only was Jesus joyful, did you catch what he says here? He wants you to have that same joy. It's literally this picture of a container and it's overflowing. It's so full. He wants your joy to be full like his joy is full. And so that's going to be our goal this morning as we take a look at, at John 15, is to see what that joy is and how Jesus fills us up with it. Now, because of all the pictures, it may take a little bit to sink in this whole fact that Jesus was actually joyful. So as that sinks in, I want to just make sure we understand what joy really is. What does that word mean? When, when Jesus speaks of joy, when the Bible speaks of joy, what is he talking about? When you hear the word joy, what, what kinds of things do you think of? Maybe happiness? Gladness? And I think that's part of it. But yet, happiness and gladness, that, that's kind of a feeling, that's an emotion when you experience something satisfying or enjoyable. And so if, it's, if that's what happiness is, then it's, it depends on your circumstance, doesn't it? You may have happiness sometimes, you may not have happiness sometimes. And so that's not quite what joy is. 
What else do you think of? The Bible often uses the word rejoice. Over and over again, you hear the word rejoice, especially in the Psalms, and I think that's part of it. But rejoicing, if you see somebody rejoicing, that's really the outward expression of the feeling of happiness, right? And so that also is dependent on your circumstances. There may be times where you feel like rejoicing, and there's sometimes you don't. So that's not quite it. So what is joy? I tried to spend a good deal of time studying and, and thinking about this, and, and this is a, a definition that I came up with today for what Jesus is talking about with joy. A certainty in the deepest part of your soul of what? Of God's love for you and his will for your life, and it never changes with any circumstance. I know that's a lot. I'm just going to quickly repeat it. It's a certainty in the deepest part of your soul of God's love for you and his will for your life, and it doesn't change with any circumstance. That's joy. So how can Jesus say he has joy? Well, keep that definition in mind and look at some of the words that Jesus uses here. As the Father has loved me. And then later in verse 10, he says, I remain in my Father's love. That's that first part of the definition, isn't it? In the deepest part of Jesus' soul, he was certain of his Father's love. Jesus had experienced this perfect father-son relationship from all eternity. Try to fathom that. Before the world was even created, every day, it's no time, but every day, perfect love between the father and the son. And it didn't change when he came to this earth. Constantly, the father said over and over, this is my son whom I love. He was certain of the father's love. And no circumstance changed that for him. There were times where he must have been on this big high because there were people all around him. He was so popular and he was performing miracles and people were believing in him, but there were also super lows where nobody was with him. He was abandoned, never changed. He was certain of his father's love. And that brought him joy. And you remember the second part of the definition of, of joy that I mentioned? Being in line with the father's will? Well, look what he also says here. I have kept my Father's commands. What does God the Father want? Well, he lays that out for us in his commands. And, and what Jesus is saying in here, his will was always perfectly in line with the Father's. Whatever God loved, Jesus loved. Whatever God despised, Jesus despised. Whatever God wanted, Jesus wanted. And he ever, never did anything he disliked always perfectly in line with that. But I think there's even more to Jesus being perfectly in line with God's will. For Jesus to want what God wants and love what God loves, it's more than about commands. It's more than moral behavior. What does God want more than anything in the world? He wants you to be saved. And what does God love even more than commands? You. You. People. And so Jesus demonstrates how in line with God's will he is when he goes on and says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. The things the Father loves, I love. And greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for one's friends. You are my friend. Wow. Isn't that amazing that Jesus says that? Now how does this bring Jesus joy? I would explain it this way. So last weekend, obviously, was Mother's Day. And if I'm completely honest, I feel a little bad about this past Mother's Day because, yes, technically, I got my wife a gift because we, we bought plane tickets and we traveled to Minnesota so that we could be with our, all of our kids. And so we were all together on Mother's Day. That was kind of the gift, right? But Mother's Day morning comes and I just... Gave her a card. There's no like physical gift. And it just felt wrong. I probably should have. I'm sorry. I should have given you something else. <laughs> but why, why does that make me feel bad? Well, it's nice to give people gifts, isn't it? When you truly care about them, it, gives, it puts a smile on your face when you give somebody a gift. So I want you to think about this. Imagine that everything was available to you. 
How would you feel if you were able to give someone you love that thing that they need the most? I'm not talking about stuff, more stuff to put in the house or the garage. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real things that they need the most, like relief from that stressful situation or maybe a cure from what they're suffering from or maybe just real lasting rest or maybe a healed relationship. Those kinds of things. Something they really need. How would you feel if you were able to give that person you love that one thing that they need? Wouldn't that put a smile on your face? No one could wipe that smile off your face, right? If you understand where I'm going, then, then you start to get a sense of what Jesus must have felt, what the joy he must have felt. Because that's exactly what he did for his friends. And you... You are Jesus' friends. Because you're his friends, he gave you the one thing that you need for all of eternity. He rescued you from the sure death and damnation that every sin comes or sends hurling your way like a runaway train. Jesus, as your friend, basically shoved you out of the way of that train and he took on the collision. That's what the cross is all about. He sacrificed his life. He made the ultimate sacrifice. He laid down his life on the cross. He paid for all of your sins so that you have peace with God. That's what Jesus did. And, and that is what puts a smile on Jesus' face. That's what makes his joy absolutely full, knowing that he did all of that for you. And so look at the two things that Jesus is talking about. He had those, right? The certainty that he had God's love and he was in line with God's will, and nothing was going to change that. No wonder Jesus said he had joy. And so based on that, I think maybe we need to have some new pictures of Jesus. Huh? Some smiling pictures. But then again, maybe that's not it. Right? Maybe the, the whole idea of, of a serious Jesus, a non-smiling Jesus, doesn't have anything to do with what we just talked about. I know we said that his job was serious, he suffered a lot, and so that's why he didn't have a smile. But maybe that's not it. Maybe we never put a smile on Jesus because it's tainted by our own idea of joy. Our own idea of joy. You see, our idea of joy, what, what often in everyday life puts a smile on our face it doesn't have anything to do with the things that we just talked about from Scripture, does it? What puts a smile on our face very often doesn't have anything to do with God's love or God's will. It often has more to do with my love, my will. Right? What often puts a smile on our face isn't about God because God's word and, and God's love and, and his commandments, that would be about something outside of ourselves. And if we are honest, that, that feels like it spoils our fun, doesn't it? Because if we go right deep down to our hearts, and if we're honest, I think the real issue is we are the happiest when we're loving ourselves. Selfishness, right? Think about things that we think of that put a smile on our face. It's, it's about loving ourselves, right? Right? And if it's about loving ourselves, then it's no wonder why we never paint Jesus with a smile. Because that really would make Jesus sad. Our selfishness doesn't bring happiness like we think it will. Instead, it brings eternal separation from God. It's the saddest thing ever. So let's explore that a little bit. Why do we do that? Why are we so selfish? Do we really feel that deprived of joy and love, that we feel we have to manufacture it for ourselves. I, think, I see things on social media all the time where, where people must feel like that when we must feel like that because you, you see things like, I'm in charge of my own happiness. You have to be in charge of your own happiness. But Jesus is saying, 
You may feel like that at times, but that's simply not true when you are in Christ. That's not true at all. Jesus, that joy that he has, he wants you to have that. And remember the two parts of the joy. Feeling loved by God and being in line with God's will. So that's what he gives us. I want you to think about, about God's love in, in this way. We would call it really great love if somebody just donated thousands of dollars to us when we absolutely need it. Wouldn't we? That'd be great. We would call it even greater love if somebody donated a kidney to us or a piece of their liver to save our lives. I think we would sing that person's praises the rest of our lives. I'll tell you something. Those things, as great as they are, are tiny, minuscule compared to what Jesus does for you. Do you want to feel loved? Look at Jesus. Jesus did everything to show his love for you. He had the compassion. Even though he saw that selfishness in us, even though he knows that we are by nature enemies of God, yet he had the compassion to look on us and to choose us as the objects of his affection and to willingly put himself in front of the wrath of God instead of us and to shed his blood and die so that we have peace with God. You don't have to question if you're loved. You are loved. Again, these are the same words, but as the Father has loved me, that perfect love that Jesus enjoyed, that's what he gives you. Greater, because greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends. You're loved. And you can know that in the deepest part of your soul. You can be certain of that regardless of circumstance. Doesn't that put a smile on your face? But Jesus must not think that's a big enough smile. Because he gives you more. Remember that second part? about having that full joy. It's about being in line with God's will. Well, that's why he goes on to say this. You have my love, right? Remain in that. Stay there. Stay in my love. And here's how. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. And my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Think of this really neat chain of joy. So, Jesus had joy because he received perfect love from his Father, and that perfect love from his Father motivated him to love us. Right? So what does that mean? We are the next chain. We receive perfect love from our Savior. And as we enjoy that perfect love from our Savior, we are motivated to love each other the way Jesus loved us, and on and on. This is my command. Love each other as I have loved you. But maybe, maybe that wording kind of wipes the smile off your face just a little bit. Because that word command, some translations say obey. We see keep here. I think I even read a different one in the gospel reading. Um, keep hold of, right? The sense of this isn't drudgery. It isn't a burden. It's not coercion. It's not fear. That's not the motivation. Instead, think of the word to guard, to treasure. You have this perfect love from your Savior, and you treasure it so much that you want to, to give it. That's the attitude. Maybe just a quick example of that. It reminds me of a story I heard about a, a teenage boy. He had a, a sister who was very sickly, and she needed blood transfusions constantly, and he happened to have the same kind of type of blood. And he was afraid of needles. He was afraid of the whole process. But he decided in love that he was going to donate blood so that his sister could feel better. And it was, it was good. He, he did that. And uh, his sister did feel better. But it was interesting, after giving blood, he asked the doctor a, a strange question. He said, so how does this work? Will I uh, die right away? Or will it take a while? <laughs> you see what his line of thinking was? He thought that they were going to take all of his blood and that his heart was going to stop and he was going to pass away. Now, we can kind of la laugh that off because we know that's not how it works. 
But in his heart, in his mind, that's how he knew it worked. He was ready to give his own life so that his sister would live. Do you think in his heart that was something he felt he had to do? Something that was drudgery and this burden? Absolutely not. That's pure love that gave him joy to do this, even if he wasn't smiling. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus wants you to have that same kind of joy. You don't have to give a body part for somebody. That's not what he's saying. But you can love as Jesus has loved you. Think about the way that Jesus has loved you and, and then think, what else, what's, some, what's something that I can do to make someone else happy? What's something I can say to build up somebody else's reputation? What's something that I could go without so that maybe others can hear and experience the love of Jesus? Think about that special way that you can love as Jesus has loved, and when you find it, take a second and look in the mirror. Because I would imagine you're going to have this huge smile on your face that no one can wipe off. Why? Because of joy. In the deepest part of your soul, you have this certainty that you are loved by God. And you are in line with His will. You love what He loves. And there's no circumstance that can change that. That's joy. So if you're an artist... Get to work. Let's paint some new pictures of Jesus, huh? A joyful Jesus. I wonder if that's why, uh, one of the reasons why this new show, The Chosen, has taken off so much. Because Jesus is just portrayed in a different way. He's actually filled with joy. But here's the thing. You don't have to watch The Chosen to experience a joyful Jesus or to experience joy in your life. Just read your scriptures. Meditate each day on Jesus' love and you will know. Just as Jesus' joy was full, Yours is too. Amen. May that peace of God that goes beyond our understanding guard to keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. With joy-filled, thankful hearts, uh, we now think about our offerings to our God, responding to God in love.